A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia, and our cases this week, a doctor makes a startling claim against his wife, who is also a doctor. The husband says that the wife tried to poison him by putting Drano in his lemonade. He became suspicious because of a weird chemical taste in his mouth, so he set up a hidden camera in the kitchen of the couple's mansion. The videotapes have been turned over to the police police and the police have arrested the wife. Dare I say this is one caustic divorce. But first, the Texas case of a father on the run for 12 years who was on the FBI's most wanted list for killing his two teenage daughters in an honor killing for disobeying him. The father, an Egyptian of Muslim faith, didn't want his daughters dating American boys. He took the stand in his own defense and the jury found him guilty. He will spend the rest of his life in prison. We are recording this on Wednesday, August 17th, 2022. Our guest today is the one and only Nancy Grace. You all know her as a legal analyst. She's a former prosecutor. She's also the host of the true crime series, Bloodline Detectives. This is a unique series that explores familial DNA searches and testing, and they use that to uncover criminals and solve cold cases. The queen of crime reporting, I bow to you, my queen, Nancy Grace. (laughs) Wow, you know, it's hard to follow an intro like that. But as I so often like to point out, the star is the case. Yes. And I very carefully do not say the story because these are not stories. These are real people that have endured real suffering. It's not just a statistic or a name and a headline. For instance, the honor killing to which you referred, the victims in that case, 17-year-old Sarah and 18-year-old Amina. Sarah was shot nine times. Sarah is just a few years older than my twins, including my little Lucy. And to think of someone pumping nine bullets into a little girl like that is beyond imagining. This father, who I would like to point out has been convicted by a jury, is a jackass and is the devil's minion, and may he rot in hell. I agree with you. I agree with you. That sums up what I have to say about him. But you know I'm what, Nancy, happy. I covered this case. I went down to Texas. I went down to Oklahoma yeah. for the TV show Crime Watch Daily because he was on the run at the time. Little did I know that he was probably in Texas the entire time, right? As we find out later. Unbelievable. Being harbored by his brother and his son, both of them have been charged and will each spend about a decade in prison for harboring a fugitive. But what what so pained me, so pained me was this is a case, and we see this so much, where the mother in this case had had made a police report when the little girls were younger, claiming that they had been sexually assaulted by their father, Yasser Saeed. And then the parents convince the children to recant the story, and therefore the police drop the case. And so, well, Nancy, what do you do with that? A technical legal term at you. That is total BS. Complete BS. Because I have had and prosecuted a case where two little girls were raped by their mother's live in. The mother, of course, sided with the live in, a phenomenon I saw over and over and over where women cover up for the men that molest their children. And the little, the littlest one who uh, she was raped, full on raped, when she was three, over and over and over by the live-in who had all the money. He ran all the horse carriage livery trade in Atlanta. You know those tourist horses. Oh yes. Also had a a limo service rolling in money, and the mom thought it was more important to keep living off him like a parasite as opposed to standing up for her children. On the stand, 
the little girl recanted. The little girl recanted. Prior to taking the witness stand, she continued her recant until I direct examined her. I had already spoken to her before. The defense attorney and the mother had gotten her and her sister to recant prior to trial. But I went back through what happened to her on the day she was molested. And she told the jury exactly what happened, what truthfully happened. I have her in my mind right now. She was about, oh gosh, four feet tall. And she had to have 50 barrettes all matching on her head and matching her little outfit. And I looked at the mother and I thought, you POC, another technical legal term. You dress her up on the outside for me to see, but yet you allow her to continue being raped. So, Nancy, I want to ask you something because what? you brought you brought up the mother here, how angry you Ugh. were. And, and there are a lot of very strong feelings. A lot of our listeners have very strong feelings about the mother in this case, Patricia Owens. So Patricia married Yasser Saeed when she was only 15 years old. He was something uh -huh. like 29 years old. Yeah. And she says soon after that, it, it became abusive. She says it was an abusive relationship. She tried to leave several times, like that <laughs> one time when she went to the police to make Which a report. Successfully left the home and went to live elsewhere with relatives, getting her girls safe. And what did she do? She went back to him. Yes, I know. Look, I worked at the Battered Women's Center as a volunteer for nine years at night. I get the Battered Women's Syndrome. But there is a point where when you're getting battered, it's bad enough. But when your child is getting raped, and you let that happen and you take them back into it when they're begging mommy no, then that's on you, lady. And she testified in, in the sense she gave her victim impact statement, which we're going to play in a little bit. Um, and, and so, again, very mixed feelings here because she made that decision. She was in Oklahoma. She had set up an apartment. She had gotten the girls out. And days before they're murdered, she makes the decision to come back because Yasser got to her. And I think, and I agree with you, but I don't think anyone will feel the pain of that loss and that decision more than this mother. Well... Um, I agree I know. with you. I, I, I agree I, with you. That still does not make what she did right. And now the girls are dead. Yes. Murder. Murder. Yes. Oh, absolutely. He absolutely. Them back into the home and the father, who she knew was an abuser, who was a sex predator on these two very girls, were murdered. Horrific. The It was so horrific. And I, wa I want to play the 911 tape because... Nancy, you talked about how the girls were shot. They were shot inside a taxi cab outside the Omni Hotel in Irving, Texas. And what is unbelievable to me is that Sarah, who was shot the nine times, she manages to call 911 while she is dying and she identifies her shooter, her killer, her father. She clearly does it. So we're going to play a clip from my original investigation that's got the 911 call for you. Listen to this. A terrified 17-year-old girl pleads for her life as she's being murdered. Oh my God! We hear cries and then silence. And when the bloody bodies of Sarah Saeed and her 18-year-old sister Amina are found riddled with bullets in an abandoned taxi, investigators launch an international manhunt for the missing driver the two teenagers own father who would think that their father would kill them i think it takes a pretty evil person to murder your two daughters he's a monster nancy i mean she clearly identifies her father on that 911 call as the shooter she sure does and not only that when you think about what uh not only the girls but lady justice has had to endure so if, if he is all about his daughters, then why did he flee the same and then have the gall to plead not guilty after murdering them? He goes on the run for years at the top of the FBI most wanted list. He flees contemporaneous with their murder. I mean, wouldn't you expect a father to be going, I want justice. I want to find the man that killed my girls. 
and I don't care what it takes. And I, what brings to my to my mind is Mark Class. Oh, uh, I remember I covered that. Polly. Yes, his daughter Polly was kidnapped, ultimately um, murdered. Yes, the cops came into his apartment like, "Hey, your daughter's missing." He's like, "Here." Take my fingerprints, take my blood, search my house, search my office, search my car, do whatever you need to do to rule me out so you can find my daughter. Instead, this guy goes on the run with the help of the brother and the son and eludes police. Then he gives Lady Justice another slap in the face by pleading not guilty and making this jury sit through a bunch of lies during his jury trial. And then he takes the stand. The only witness called by the defense is Yasser Saeed, who's 65 years old at this time. And he tells this incredible story through an interpreter that he said, oh, I was just going to take the girls out for dinner and that I thought someone was following me. So I left the cab and I left the girls in the cab. Listen, if you think someone's following you, would you ever leave your daughters unattended? Never. Never. So we're going to play a clip now of his testimony through the interpreter as he is describing why he left them in the cab. Saeed admits he was upset about his daughter's dating activity. I was upset because in my culture, it's something to get upset about. But he denied killing them. For sure did not. Saeed went on to say he left the girls alive in the taxi cab after feeling he was being followed and that he was in danger. I told them the car is yours. You do whatever you want. Since they know how to drive, I left the car for them. What a lie. And thank goodness, and this doesn't always happen. Thank goodness the jury could see through it. I mean, an honor killing. I wouldn't even put those two words in the same phrase. And the thought of them being with an an American boy, that's just an excuse for his anger. His rage, his predatory nature got the best of him, and mommy let it happen. And I have prosecuted domestic homicides, aggravated assault homicides, where women were in abusive relationships that were beaten uh, to the felony point of ag assault or even aggravated battery and domestic homicide. I'm a victim's rights advocate, including battered women, but I draw the line at keeping your children in a home where they're raped and murdered. Uh Uh-uh, no. Nancy, what role do you think this played? One of the things that he did is he videotaped his daughters through the years, and he would say these really disturbing things about, oh, look at you. I'm not even going to repeat these horrible things he said in in very sexual nature, close-ups of their buttocks, of their breasts, of their eyes. Um, He was letting them play with a gun. He would, when one of them worked in a convenience store, he literally sat in the car and videotaped it in front of the store watching her and saying to the other sister, "Uh uh-oh, she's going to get into trouble for talking to that man. You know, she's just a cashier. She's checking the guy out and the other sister's trying to calm daddy down. I mean, what do you think? I mean, I feel like these tapes tell the story. I mean, they're speaking from beyond the grave. Can I tell you how literally physically sick those tapes make me? Not only because of their content, but because those girls could have been saved. Their lives could have been saved. They could have gone on true as a victim of incest, of rape by their father, but they would have had their life. They could have lived. Like so many rape victims, you're never the same, but you do go on. You have a life. You have a chance at rebuilding your life. They have nothing now. You heard that 911 call. The father should have been prosecuted when it was first brought up to police. They should not have dropped the case just because the mommy backed out. Mommy's back out all the time in favor of the man. That doesn't mean that the state has to back out, win or lose at trial, at least try for Pete's sake. Yeah, yeah. I I, want to bring in now the mother's um, statement because, as we said, Patricia Owens, you know, there's a lot of guilt here. There's a lot of blame. 
I'm not I'm okay defending her. I am not defending her, Nancy. I am just saying that we all must live with the consequences of our actions. And um, I can't imagine a more horrific ending to her decision. And so I, I want her, I want you all to hear her in her own words. What I find interesting about this part is she's very, very nervous as she's trying to read from her letter. And then when she goes off her letter and goes directly to Yasser, all of a sudden she's so much more focused. And, I, and here's the other thing I want everyone to listen for very carefully. The judge admonishes Yasser Saeed because when she starts in on him, he starts fussing. He starts, you know, moving around, talking, waving his hands. And the judge tells him to just sit down and be quiet and listen. So we're going to play the clip. And you know what? You can keep those evil eyes glaring. Just glare away. Because this is going to be the last time that you see me. But, but it won't be... Keep your client um, quiet so the victim can, well, the victim's family can say their piece, okay? Thank you. But I will tell you, I pray on a daily base that you suffer, that you suffer the pain that Amina went through that you suffer, that Sarah went through. And I hope, I just hope that every time you turn around, you, you have bad dreams. I hope your life is so miserable that you wished you would have just killed yourself. But no, you're too coward to hurt your sister, uh, yourself. But you wasn't too coward to, to put nine bullets in our baby daughter, Sarah, and two bullets in our oldest daughter, Amina. At this time, you are nothing. You are a prisoner. You are a murderer. And the devil. Yeah, he's the devil, all right. Well, she got one thing right. He's the devil. You know, a lot of people uh, don't believe that there is a God and a devil. I absolutely believe that this guy, Yasser Saeed, is the devil incarnate. He, he embodies all that is evil in this world. And though she is suffering now, and I don't want anyone to suffer. I really don't. But this is an outcome in which she had a hand. Yes. And I am not going to shy away from the truth. She brought the girls back to the devil's den. What did she think was going to happen? Nothing good. No, no. It's, it's so sad when you think that they just got away. And that feeling that they must have had, you know, for that one moment where they thought they were free, how glorious that moment must have felt and how sad that it ended this way. So horrible. And the, you know, and the girls, she convinced the girls to go with their father. She said, I need to go back to Texas. This was the story because I need to put flowers on my mother's grave. Then she says, your father wants to take you out for dinner. So the girls go, they think that dad's going to talk to them maybe have a conversation. And I think children, don't you think this, Nancy, they're always hopeful. They're always, children are always hopeful, no matter how scared they are in the end. Really do believe that children, and very often better women, do believe in that happy ending. They want to believe what's on the Hallmark Christmas card of the happy family and the fireplace it pains me, it really pains me to even talk about this case because of what you just said. I believe that in the back of their minds, in the bottom of their hearts, they wanted a happy, normal family. And they begged their mom not to be with the dad. She wouldn't listen. Just, just a horrible, horrible case. Well, just about three hours of deliberations, 
and Yasser Saeed was convicted of capital murder. The prosecutors did not pursue the death penalty. He will spend his life in prison. No and opportunity. I agree with that. Look, you disagree with the with that? Yes, I disagree. Look, I do not want to get into a big entanglement about death penalty. Yes, no. But I will say this. If you're going to have the death penalty, if your jurisdiction wants the death penalty, then Yasser Saeed is the one to get it. He murdered two people, cold-blooded, went on the run, so many aggravating circumstances under which he would qualify for the DP. Did he get it? No, because the state did not seek it. He I don't know why they didn't seek it. Honestly, I don't. I mean, fight with me all you want to about whether we should have it or whether we shouldn't have it. But if you are going to have it, this is the perfect candidate. I agree with you there. Well, may he rot in prison. Our next case is out of Southern California, where a dermatologist is accused of poisoning her husband, who is a doctor, too. According to police, 45-year-old Dr. Yu Yu, who goes by the name of Emily, Dr. Emily Yu, has been arrested for poisoning her 53-year-old husband, Dr. Jack Chen, who is a radiologist. Nancy, the man is a doctor, and he said back in March, he started not feeling well. He said, it was the oddest thing. I had like a chemical taste in my mouth and I had a very upset stomach and you know he goes to see a doctor and then this is this is to me what's always fascinating Nancy what clicked in his brain where he said you know what I think my wife is up to something and I'm going to put a hidden camera in the kitchen and I'm going to watch and then he says those videotapes because we've only seen stills from it he says those videotapes show that she allegedly put Drano in his drinks. And he says he captured it on three different occasions and then turned it over to police. What do you make of this one, Nancy? Well, for one thing, I finally get to smile. Not that I don't feel badly for Dr. Jack Chen because he suffered incredible pain. He had, oh, let's see, esophagitis, gastritis. It, his whole insides were burned from a caustic result. It's like putting Ajax and rubbing it in to the inside of your mouth. What do you think is going to happen? It will eat through your gums and, and the inside of your mouth and your tongue. That's what happened to the inside of his stomach. Uh, now, uh, for, first of all, he had one camera trained on a wide shot, which I love. It's like a cinematographer. And uh, then it, it, at least... On one occasion, she stays in the kitchen as he's drinking it, to my understanding, going, ha ha, yay. <laughs> and, you know, in order, but, but now her team is saying, oh, no, 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 that's not what happened at all. Um, she was pouring Drano into a cup to then pour it into the drain, because if you pour it straight in the drain, it will splash. Uh huh. No, right, because, no. Because Have they never used Drano? Every time they say that, that uh, the prosecutor is just going to hold up a, an X-ray of Chen's stomach. All right. That drain I went somewhere and something happened to his stomach. His stomach is like ground beef. It's just hor it's a horrible. I, I mean, I don't know that he can ever fully recover from what was done to his esophagus all the way down to his stomach. I, I mean, there's no he didn't fake that. I guarantee you he didn't drink Drano himself. No. So, in fact, I mean, he's taken. He would, been, he would have been dead by now if they had caught it. And, and he's taken a leave of absence right now to deal with his health because they're both working physicians to deal with his health and to deal with the the trauma of finding out that your wife of ten years is trying to kill you. Now, according to court records and attorneys for for both of them, this marriage was toxic itself. And Dr. Chen says that Emily was horrible to him, horrible to the children, verbally abusive, physically abusive. He said it was a horrible situation. So, I mean, and he has since filed for divorce and a restraining order here. But I mean, as I say this all the time, Nancy, isn't it just easier to get a divorce? Isn't it just you easier? Know, I have asked that question for so long. Why not just get a divorce? And all of these, wait, hey, here's the good one. You know, in the um, super villain movies, 
or in the James Bond movies, they always have some bizarre way of killing the yes. spy. Like they're going to hold him over a shark tank and then lower him down by the hour, and then they get away. Okay, so in this case, just get a divorce. Why go through this elaborate plan of poisoning and watching and poisoning and the camera? Blah, blah, blah. Just get a divorce. Just And, I mean, if she was abusing the children, which I firmly believe that she was, calling them pig, calling them ugly, using the F word on them, uh, physical abuse. Hey, she's going to poison her husband. Why should I believe she didn't abuse her children? He could have proven that in court with without all of this. They should have separated immediately when the abuse on the children started. Look, I love my husband deeply, but make no mistake about it. I will do whatever I have to do to protect my children. I know they're 14 years old now and my son is six foot five, but it would be a cold day in H E double oil that I would leave them in a toxic home for it to get worse and worse and worse. And that's what happened here. I say, leave the minute you realize you cannot salvage the relationship, protect your children. So they have two children, a daughter and a son, ages eight and 10. They live in a $2.5 million mansion in Irvine in a very nice area. They are very successful. They're very well educated. Here's the other thing, Nancy. If you are this well educated, which of course they are, they have medical degrees, could they, could she, and again, it's all alleged and she, you know, she's been arrested. The prosecutors haven't charged yet. So presumed innocent. Now, now, Explain to me why she didn't come up with something more clever than the Drano, because there are a lot more clever ways to try and poison someone, as we've seen, and half those people who try that don't have medical degrees. Why does she use Drano? I'll tell you why. <laughs> right. Drano. I don't know uh, if you've experienced this or not, but rich people, you, you can't tell them anything. The worst defendants and cases I've had have been rich people because they think they know everything. Yes, they have degrees. Yes, they have educations. So they all think that they're smarter than everybody else. Well, they're not. They're not. Just no. that simple. Or she wouldn't be in the fix she's in right now. I believe she, with all of her degrees and all of her education and all of her money and her great house, her great cars, thought she would not be caught. She has had years of telling everybody else what to do and never believed her husband would, let me say, have a little insurrection and employ video cameras on her. Well, he did. Yep. And the, his attorney turned it over to police and prosecutors, and then they served the search warrant, and then they arrested her right after that. What's interesting is that Emily U's defense attorney, David Wall, claims that, as you said, that you was using the Drano for its intended purposes. The drain, not the husband. The drain, not the husband. And he also says, you know, because this is out there, we got to get the other side, if there can be another side here. The idea that, he says, quote, the idea that my client, who is a 45-year-old, well-respected dermatologist in Orange County, would destroy her life, destroy her children's lives, and then try to kill her husband is just completely absurd and untrue, and for that matter, defamatory. You so, know what? I'll let them worry about all their lawsuits after the attempted murder trial and the aggravated assault with intent to kill trial, the aggravated battery case, which means uh, in an ag assault, that means that you put someone in fear of serious bodily immediate harm. Aggravated battery is when you actually make the victim lose, uh, for instance, an eye or an arm or a hand or a stomach or an esophagus. Those are 20 to life, all of those. And I will worry about that defamation lawsuit after that. But let me be clear for the record. People do crazy things during divorces. Oh, my God. Yes. Her side is alleging that this is all made up so he could get custody of the children. Fine. If that's true, it will be outed in court. If she is innocent, which she may be, yep. it will be outed in court. And I look forward to that court date. And let me tell you something about her lawyer. Well, it's W-O-H-L, yep. correct? Mm -hmm. yep. He's a good lawyer. He's no idiot. He didn't just fall off the turnip truck. She's got a good lawyer. Yep. 
Yeah, well, what money does buy <laughs> very good and expensive defense attorneys, correct? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, it does. Now, according to jail records, Emily Yu was released on August 5th, earlier this month. She posted a $30,000 bail, and according to CBS LA, she's been suspended from her job. And according to Michelle Geely, who's a fantastic reporter here um, for CBS, one of the best in Orange County, she said, you know, I'm quoting her, she says that Emily actually called her husband from jail to come and bail her. Thank you, Bond. That took a nerve. I could not believe that when I saw that. <laughs> she actually called the husband. She allegedly tried to murder with Drano and asked him to post her bond. I that's mean, a good one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. But what is shocking to me is she actually made bond. They gave her a bond. Well, yeah. He's walking around free, man. I'd go undercover if I were him or those children. And here's another update. Jack Chen has been granted a temporary restraining order, and it states that Emily cannot contact her husband or their two children, must stay 100 yards away from them, and must move out of their home until the restraining order hearing is set, and that's for August 18th. That ought to be very interesting. Yeah, well, you know what? If she couldn't read that Drano label, I doubt she's going to read that TRO. I would hide. I would put my children in hiding and would not show my face or their faces until this doctor, the defendant, was behind bars for good. We'll see how it plays out. So, Nancy, we want to talk to you about your new show that has a third season coming out. It is called Bloodline Detectives. It's a unique series that explores familial DNA. I'm very, very proud of Bloodline Detectives. They... Title really says it all. Uh, Bloodline Detectives. It's all about a new era of forensic technology to help us solve cases that prior to now were cold and never to be heated up. Um, I'll tell you a funny story, a true story. I think I was in about the sixth grade. I was in science class and I had the book open and they had a phrase in bold. And I looked at it and I had a premonition. I thought, sitting there at my desk, I remember this and I thought, one day I'm going to need to know how to say this. And I sounded it out with syllables until I could say it easily. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Little did I know that 20 plus years later, I would be talking about DNA in court in murder cases, rape cases, sodomy, child molestation cases, where literally lives hung in the balance. For uh, Forensic technology is always advancing by the hour. And Bloodline Detectives, we're starting season three, and we have just released season two on streaming. Our cases all around the world, largely in the U.S., where murder mysteries go cold until 10, 20, even 60 years later, forensic investigators crack the case. They may do it through genetic genealogy, such as the Joseph D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer case. Mm -hmm. They may do it through epithelial touch DNA, where we uh, uh, unknowingly shed thousands of skin epithelial cells every day on things that we touch. Now that DNA can be harvested and then analyzed. We are even to a point where there are DNA labs, such as one that comes to mind named Othram. I, I, love, I love them. I love, I love uh, them. There are others, but I just happen to have just done a case with them where their specialty, one of their specialties is degraded DNA, DNA that's been in water, been in mud, mixtures of DNA, where there's more than one DNA uh, provider, like two bloods intermingled Mm -hmm. that's Mm -hmm. mixed with dirt, that's compromised, it's old. They have techniques that regular crime labs don't. I always had my stuff sent to the state crime lab, and they were excellent, but now that technology has advanced. Bloodline Detectives is about new forensics and 
I love the cutting edge technology that we use and investigate in the cases and bloodline detectives. So now season one and two are streaming and season three is about to go to air on linear TV. It's on various networks in various markets. I'm yes. really proud of it. And seasons one and two, they're on Pluto, Peacock, yeah. Vizio. Really, it depends uh, on, on multiple uh, platforms that it's oh, available. Yeah. So, Google it. Bloodline Detectives. I'm really, really proud of it. Yes. And congratulations on that. And we love Othram Labs. We've had them on the program before. They're amazing. Well, they're that, rock stars. Rock stars. They are. Okay, it is time for our comments section. These are the cases that you all are talking about on our social media. Don't worry, Nancy had to step away for a second. She'll be right back. But right now, we're going to do comments while well, Nancy's doing crime business. Um, <laughs> Will Updike is our producer, and he's joining us now. Hey, Will. Hey, how's it going? Great. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we have an interesting sort of business model for this one. Uh, a Florida woman armed with a pitchfork and a whip was recently accused of trying to sell teddy bears behind a Publix grocery store. Now, this case comes out of Claremont, Florida. This 56 year old woman, uh, Lisa Sloan, was apparently attempting to sell teddy bears behind a Publix grocery store. Now, the store manager reportedly told the Florida Highway Patrol troopers that she used a pitchfork to stab a minivan in the process of all this. Uh, so <laughs> reports alleged that at some point, Sloan, uh, the suspect here, began yelling and running around with a pitchfork and a whip. She was reportedly told to stop by the troopers, but she refused those orders. Uh, so a trooper told reporters that Sloan appeared to be highly intoxicated on some sort of stimulant, the direct quote there. And Sloan reportedly told authorities that she felt no pain anymore and that God was in control. So this poor woman, she was eventually taken into custody. And while in the patrol car, she allegedly unbuckled her seatbelt and started kicking toward the window. Uh, but she was she didn't escape. Uh, it, it didn't go. It, it didn't go as well. Uh, hopefully her teddy bear sales went a little bit better than that. But she was arrested and booked into the Lake County Jail on two thousand dollar bond for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. Um Wow. Uh, a lot a, a lot of people were kind of interested in this business model. Isaac 84 <laughs> said <laughs> her business model is unique. I'm sure she sold more than used teddy bears behind that Publix. No. Oh, yes. uh, yeah. No official reports on that. Mike S said salesperson of the year, which what a, what a plaque if they had uh, if, if someone put one of those up behind the public. It would have a little pitchfork, morning. though. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. Santa Claus apparently uh, has some free time. Uh, they said, I don't want to live in a world where arming yourself with a pitchfork is a crime. Teddy bear sales are big business. It's better to be safe than sorry. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if there are any sort of risks involved with selling teddy bears behind a public I You know, I don't know if you have to protect yourself. I, yeah, well, I've these were used. Position. These were used teddy bears. I believe so. Yes. Yes. Pre-loved, we would say in the teddy bear business. Pre-loved. Pre-loved. I mean, there's, there's got to be a big business there. Kids grow out of teddy bears all the time. Somebody else probably needs them. Kevin Z says everybody knows Florida man, but rarely anyone mentions Florida woman which it's, you know, you know, I hate to pick on Florida in these segments, which we, it, they just have some interesting crimes always coming out of there, but the headlines are always Florida man. So it's nice to get a little variety in there. Absolutely, right? A little diversity here. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Jill P got our pun in uh, for the week. She said, that's in bear, the same. Mm -hmm. Sorry, couldn't help myself. Alpha XO uh, is gonna wrap this one up, said, uh, could not with this headline, said, yeah, that's enough internet for the day. Um, which is probably right. Uh, I should probably do the same thing, but it's always great to read your comments. Uh, as always, if you want a chance to get your comment feature on the show, go ahead and leave those over on our Instagram page or Facebook or our YouTube community page. Uh, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're trying to get the final push to 5 million. Right, because once we get to 5 million, we are going to start having all of you on not all of you at the same time. <laughs> but all five one, million. All five million of you <laughs> on the show um, to participate. We haven't figured out exactly how yet. We're still working on that, <laughs> but that should be fun. You all have comments. So now we're going to have to figure out how to get you on the program. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Will. Have a good week. Yeah, thanks. You too.
And also, we want to make sure, because Nancy, you're everywhere. You're also the host of Crime Stories with Nancy Grace on Fox Nation and Sirius XM. You're everywhere. Um, I follow you on social media, especially on Instagram, because I just love, I know this is silly, but I love your children. And your son has like shot up so tall, so crazy. Is he really 6'5"? Six, 6'5 five? Six, five and a half. Ah, I can't believe it. And, you know, he had his first day. Big boy is his nickname and little girl. They had their first day of high school today. Nancy. I'm happy and sad all at the same time. Nancy. Can I tell you one more thing? They made all A's from pre-K all the way through eighth grade. You have me all misty-eyed because I love it. You you know, you all go to church on Sunday and you post the most beautiful pictures. I swear to you, I look at your children and I think both of them, both the girl and the boy, they will be the next Archbishop of Canterbury with those cherub faces. Love them so much. And you know what? They're such a blessing to me because after the murder of my fiance, I never thought that I would, you know, remarry ever. And I really mourned and uh, for, for way, way too long. I guess there's not a right time to mourn, but you know, I focused all of that into my cases, putting this bad guy away and that bad guy and that bad guy and that bad guy, until I was almost to the point where I was too old to have children. And my long time sweetheart, David, we got married, we decided on Tuesday, we're getting married, finally after decades of being together, uh, we got married that Saturday. And it's just been such a blessing in my life because for the first time, I have this reason to turn it off or try to turn it off at the end of the day so they can have a happy and focused mother. Before I never had a reason, it was murder and mayhem 24 seven, 365. But now I have this joy in my life. It's given me another reason to live. Oh, Nancy. See, I just love you. I, I love you. You are a wonderfully complicated, sweet, kind, tough woman with a marshmallow on the inside for your kids and your family and, and for survivors of crime. That's why I love you. Thank you for coming on the program. I am so honored to have you. It is just, you are a blessing. Please follow Nancy on Instagram for the softer side of Nancy, <laughs> for her delicious children. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I'm going to go wipe my tears away and get on to the next murder. All right. Let me just get everybody out of here. As you know, you can follow me at Anna G News, Anna with one N. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can get all our episodes of the podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, this is True Crime Daily, the podcast. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And as we always say, don't do crime.